Hello. Uh, now we're going to work with a le Lecture 9, Tracking and Parameter Estimation Techniques in the Introduction to Radar Systems course, and this is part one of that lecture. Uh, here's the, our generic radar block diagram again. We're going to show you uh, what the area of the radar we're going to be studying. Uh, after we've gone through the uh, receiver, signal processor, and we've detected the targets, then we want to get the best estimate of the observables that we've measured, the range, the azimuth, the Doppler velocity, etc. And that's called parameter estimation. And then we want to correlate those detections and those best estimates from scan to scan and uh, get them all lined up, so see which ones belong to the same physical object in space, and form what we call a track. And, uh, and, and again, improve the estimate over and over as we increase the track length. And that's what we're going to be talking about in this lecture. So now let's move on. Uh, all kinds of radars, in fact, just about every radar, every radar has this, this function. Uh, be it uh, ground-based uh, range tracking radars, radars that track ballistic missiles, air traffic control radars, radars on ships that do air surveillance. They all perform these tr this tracking function. And you see some of these radars are phased array radars, and some of them have mechanical scanning dishes. Uh, this particular radar is a combination of uh, uh, of an uh, electronic scan and a mechanical scan and azimuth and elevation uh, and uh, it's a lens radar and it has tracking techniques within it they're a little different from others but uh, they all they all perform this tracking function and you're going to learn how the tracking function and the parameter estimation function differs in all of these different radars as we go through the lecture Okay, well, what are these functions that we do? So after the target's initially detected, there are a number of things that the radar has to do. We have to continue to detect the target, and once we detect the target, we want to make the best estimate we can of the target parameters from the observations we've made with the radar, our position of the target, its size and motion, etc. And then we want to associate the detections with a specific target. Are all these detections from the same target? Or are they from different t targets? We're going to use our measurements of range, angle, and Doppler to do that. And then once we start to get an idea of not just where the target was, but from looking at a number of detections from a specific target, where it's going, we want to predict where the target will be in the future so that we can take detections that are close to where the target's going to be in the future and associate them with the target. And we're going to use multiple observations that we've accrued to develop a very good so-called filtered estimate of the observables of the target track as a whole. Okay, here's an outline of what we're going to be talking about today. You see there's a number of different topics in parameter estimation and then tracking. We're going to focus on range estimation, angle estimation, particularly the technique called monopulse. And we're going to look at estimation performance. How well can we make those estimates in angle and in the various observables? And then we're going to look at Doppler velocity estimation, then continue on to tracking and summarize. Now let's move up to the estimation and go over that area in detail. Okay, so what are the things that we estimate when we have a radar antenna that puts out a beam, sends the energy out to the target, it comes back? What do we measure? Well, we measure the target's location. It's azimuth and elevation angle from where the antenna beam is pointing and from the time delay that it took the echo to come go from the, the radar out to the target and back, we measure its range. From the size of the return that we get back here, we measure the amplitude of the target and can make an estimate of the radar cross-section if the radar is very well calibrated. We can make an estimate of the radial length of the target if we have sufficient accuracy in range or high enough bandwidth. And we can measure 
the cross range um, through Doppler estimation techniques and imaging techniques, which I won't get into right now, but we can estimate the size of the target. We can also make estimates about the target's motion. Direct measurements of the target's radial velocity come through the Doppler effect. We've talked about that earlier. And from looking at our measurements and how the radial velocity changes over time, we can measure the radial acceleration and then implicitly through calculations and from these other data we can calculate the rotation and precession of the object if it's a rigid body and measure it if it's in the atmosphere its ballistic coefficient that's a measure of the drag that, that it has it's a measure of the cross-sectional area of the target and, and its mass and other attributes okay with respect to parameter estimation uh, how, how do we um, get good range, angle, and Doppler velocity? Well, the range is inversely proportional to the bandwidth of the pulse. It's proportional to the pulse width. So if we have very high bandwidth, then we'll have very good range resolution. And, and, and commensary, if we have very narrow pulses, we'll have good range resolution. Excuse me. Um, from the size of the angle beam, that will determine to a great extent our angular accuracy along with the wavelength of the radiation. The, the beam width is lambda over d, remember from our antenna lecture, and the Doppler velocities uh, is our measurement resolution is proportional to the wavelength and inversely proportional to how long we coherently integrate. So if we have a, a given wavelength radar and we coherently integrate a long time, we'll, we'll get very good Doppler, very, very small Doppler resolution, very good Doppler resolution. And each of these um, resolutions, it, the accuracy improves significantly as we increase the signal-to-noise ratio. And the, the uh, accuracy is proportional to the resolution quantity up here divided by the square root of the signal to noise ratio and that would be in natural units not in dB. The basic overall approach that we use is we look at overlapped measurements and we do range splitting what we'll see a lot more of and I'll describe later monopulse techniques and Doppler uh, filter or bin splitting. We look at the target with, one, with the range cell set in one location the rain cell set in another location, slightly overlapping measurements, and we, we look from, from looking at those differences in the measurements, we can see where within the range, angle, or Doppler cell the target really is. And that's how we hone in on its accuracy of the measurement. First, let's look at range estimation. When you see a target, you just don't see it in one range sample cell. You see it in a number of cells. And this shows the response and voltage out of a matched filter um, that we get from an echo from a simple CW pulse. And we see at these different little X's, the voltage output, they'd be our time samples if our time samples were at these locations for that pulse. Now here's the true target location, but our samples are off somewhat. And if we just looked at where we got the biggest output, our location wouldn't be quite accurate. As to, it, to, it wouldn't be the most accurate that it could be. So we can use uh, a number of different techniques. Uh, we can take these estimates and fit them to the curve where we know the match filter output to be. We can take a weighted average, weighted by the output of the uh, amplitude, and see where that would be. That would be very close. And this range accuracy will improve uh, if we increase the bandwidth. Remembering this width of the response in range is proportional to 1 over the bandwidth times 1 over the signal-to-noise ratio, which also implies it'll improve if we have better and better signal-to-noise ratio. So we, if we want better accurate estimate of range, better higher bandwidth, and higher signal-to-noise ratio are a big help. Okay, now what do we do with angular size? 
And these all go back to that first example I give you. These are examples of why those three quantities, things get better with higher amplitude. Okay, and in this case, in antenna size, it improves with beam width. If you think back to the antenna lecture, if we have a parabolic dish reflector, here's the feed, um, the beam width is proportional to the wavelength, approximately equal to the wavelength divided by the diameter of the uh, antenna, or its aperture, and the beam width in degrees is this quantity times 180 divided by pi. And if we plot over here the half power beam width as a function of the antenna diameter, and if we increase the antenna aperture size, the beam width goes down. So we get better and better beam width if we either make the wavelength smaller or the aperture bigger. And here's this example. In the example, these three lines were drawn for um, here down for an S-band uh, 10 centimeter radar and X-band, uh, excuse me, a 1 gigahertz approximately L, a little little bit lower frequency than L band, and then a, a, up in the, almost to the UHF frequency range of 300 megahertz, 100 centimeter wavelength. But you can see as you go a factor of for a given antenna diameter, if you go a factor of 10 in uh, wavelength smaller, you'll get a factor of 10 smaller in beam width. Okay. Now let's look at angular resolution in a little more detail. And this whole idea if we take two different looks at a target. Okay? Now say we have um, located, here, here we have the antenna main beam response and we're blowing it up and we have two angular positions of the beam. One over here and one over here. And if the target is located in the center, its response that this first antenna will see is a small, a small response from the yellow, from the light colored antenna, and a large response from the, the left hand antenna. And as we move the antenna beam over to the right, you see that the the, uh, the the beams get closer and closer and closer together to the way they are equal when the two antennas are directly aligned with the target and then when they're not aligned when this one the yellow one is aligned exactly with the target and the blue one is blue beam is not you see that it's this this would be the response you get from the two antennas. So th this means of detection provides a course location and angle. And it, it's uh, we isolated within the beam width of the antenna. We can get uh, typical accuracies on a one degree beam width at 100 kilometers will be um, 1.7 kilometers and that's huge. So what we need to do is to do angle estimation techniques which give measurement accuracies much greater than the beam width. Now there are a number of different ways we can do that. One we can use sequential lobing, another we can use conical scanning, and a third we can use monopulse techniques. And I'm going to discuss them one at a time. First sequential lobing. Now with sequential lobing, we take the antenna and we know approximately where the target is. It's located out along this dashed line. That's where the target is located. And we see a visualization of power versus angle here. And here's the target. And we have beam one and we have beam two. And what we do is we send out two beams moving the antenna slightly to the left of where we believe the target is and slightly to the right and we do this sequentially at two different times. We reuse the same receiver hardware to make these beams so that you, you do them one after the other and the response we get 
uh, if we were off to the left, um, actually in this case, if we were off to the right, if the target was off to the right, is we get the it more would be more of the target amplitude would be in beam two than in beam one, and as we move the the beams the the center between the two beams over a little bit shifting it to the left you'd have a little less amplitude from beam two and a little more from beam one and then you do it a, a third time and when the two beams are giving equal amplitude then you know the target is exactly between the two beams and that gives you you do this reiteration with a control loop that redirects the antenna uh, location to equalize the beam response from the two separate beams and that's a sequential lobing, how the sequential lobing technique is used to measure where the target is within a beam. Conical scanning works slightly differently. You have again a dish antenna typically and what you do is you take the antenna beam and you rotate it in a circle about the expected location of the target and, and so the beam will be rotating about an axis and it won't be exactly where the target is. And this other a line going out from the antenna is where the target is. Like it's the uh, the line connecting the target and the antenna. So, but you're rotating off that target axis about some rotation axis that you think is near the target, but not there. If you plot the received amplitude um, as a function of time, you'll get this wavy line. Uh, for the envelope and what you'll actually see, excuse me, is as you rotate the antenna, the antenna beam will move from here to here to here to here about the target and if the target will be seen with different amplitude as it rotates. Now from the, f the phase of modulation of the envelope, that's how this varies, that will give you the angle error that you're off the rotation axis. And the, ampli the amplitude of modulation gives you the, the displacement that you're off. So you can find out the, uh, both the uh, direction and location of this target axis from the rotation axis exactly and that will give you an exact measurement of where the antenna, of where the target is. And if you set this uh, system up with a closed loop control loop, you can move the um, rotation axis slowly to where you believe the target axis is, and when you have no uh, sinusoidal change, in the amplitude, then you know you're right on axis and tracking the target perfectly. And that would be the exact location within the beam that you are. Now I'd like to move to the third technique, monopulse estimation. And monopulse estimation compares two or more simultaneous received beams at the same time. And this is going to require uh, simultaneous receiver channels to process the data. And what we do is we um, process the sum uh, and difference of two squinted beams, two beams that are off angle, that are pointed towards the target. And they're used to generate what we call an error signal. I'll go into what that is in a little more detail and, and la and later on in the view graph. And that error signal from each, cha each channel is used to, is going to require a separate receiver. Now, monopulse is an improvement over conical scanning and sequential lobing and because their performance degrades with time-varying radar returns. And monopulse methods can be made via two distinct ways of measuring monopulse. One, which is amplitude comparison, and that's more normally used, and then a phase comparison monopulse. And we'll describe both methods. And here we see at the feed of a um, parabolic reflector, uh, four different feeds. There's one in the center that was from a different frequency, but we have four different feeds 
the two upper feeds were uh, generated a sum for the elevation and the two lower ones a sum signal for the uh, the bot the, the, the going to sum the two upper channels with the two lower channels and then subtract the two upper channels from the two bottom channels. The reason it's four is you can perform the same by adding different the side channel and this side channel and subtracting those two channels you can perform a different a monopulse measurement in both azimuth and elevation. Visually you'll get to see that a little bit a bit a little bit later. But the point is is that we make simultaneous receive beams we generate. Okay? Now the pairs of offset receive beams are used to determine the location of the target relative to the the bore site, the, cent the geometric center of where the antenna is pointing. And, and we do that by calculating from the sum and the difference channel uh, an error signal. And that error signal is used to re-steer the antenna so that we're exactly pointing the antenna on target. Uh, typically, two offset receive beams are generated. And with those, we, as I said earlier, we generate a sum and a difference. And we use, again, uh, separate receivers for each of these. Now here's what we, we end up having. We have a target located at the center and we have beam, we have two separate beams that are generated, one from beam A and one from beam B. And here are those two beams. And then we send them into a box called a hybrid, a microwave device called a hybrid junction, which is able to perform simultaneously uh, on the traveling electromagnetic waves, um, an addition of them and a subtraction of those two signals. And the addition of the two signals we call the sum, and the difference we call the difference. And when they they come out two separate ports, and we and we call those the sum channel and the difference channel. Okay, and the difference channel between these two beams because they're slightly different. Will be there'll be a slight dip in the center, and the sum channel will just reinforce because the uh, it'll just be a little bit wider but have the same general characteristics and a little taller. Okay, here are some pictures of what these actual microwave devices look like, and they're rather cute things. I'm not going to get into them in a lot of uh, detail for this particular lecture. There's one they call a magic T, and the, the, you can see where uh, in this the waveguide entrance the A channel would go, and then the B would come in here, and magically, as they, as it turns out, it's electromagnetics, Maxwell's equations, coming out one end will be a sum channel, and the other end a difference channel, and then there's a, 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 a 3 dB directional coupler where you can put the A channel in one direction, the B channel in another, and coming out these two different ports will be the sum and the, the, the sum and the difference. And the funniest of all, the, this little ring with places coming out, they call a rat race. Now, for the and the the location of the ports around the circle are, are uh, fractional wavelengths. Uh, between the A and the sum is a quarter wavelength, the same between the sum and the B, and the same between the B and the delta, and then three quarters of a wavelength uh, of the radiation that you do in the sum and difference on between the A and all the way around to the difference. Now, I'm just going to leave to the interested student, in the next three view graphs I go through the logic of how when a waves come in A and B, indeed the sum and difference come out those sum and difference ports, and I'll just leave it to you to go through the logic uh, if you're interested. Uh, but trust me, they create the sum and the difference in just these two little pictures. Um, okay, so what do we end up with? And then we'll finish uh, this uh, lecture, this part of the lecture. What we end up with is to calculate that error signal is we take the magnitude of the the difference signal, and we multiply by the cosine of the phase between the difference and the sum and the difference that they are coming out those two channels, and then we divide it by the sum signal. And what we get within the beam width of the radar 
is a linear line that the and the and that the amplitude that you get out of this error signal which is the delta divided by the sum times the cosine of the phase angle between sum and difference is a measure of how far off you are the center of the beam and if it's negative you're off to the left if it's positive you're off to the right and you can see that visually if you just take the ratios of the difference over the sum these are the magnitudes and the unambiguous region is right down here okay uh, we did I've shown you just in one dimension how we do this we can do it in two dimensions we can have four feeds instead of just two I showed you two side by side for azimuth monopulse but if you do four uh, and from the four you generate the sum signal by adding the A, B, C, and D channel and these are the locations of feeds at the focus of a parabolic dish and for the elevation difference you'd take B plus D minus A plus C and for azimuth difference signal you take A plus B minus C plus D and but in this case you need three receiver channels to process the three outputs the sum, the elevation difference, and the azimuth difference. Okay. Now uh, what I'd like to do is take a brief uh, break now, and we'll come back and discuss phase comparison monopulse in the second part of the lecture. And now we move on to part two of the tracking and parameter estimation lecture of the Introduction and Radar Systems course and this is Lecture 9, Part 2. When we finished Part 1, uh, the last subject we discussed was amplitude comparison uh, uh, monopulse techniques. Now we're going to move on to talk briefly about phase comparison monopulse techniques for measuring angle, which are used far less frequently. Uh, here we have a diagram, a cartoon on the left which shows an example of how one would make that measurement. We have the radar echo coming in, a wave front from an angle uh, theta off of the bore side of the antennas and in phase comparison monopulse we use two antennas, two antennas and see here's antenna one and antenna two each having a, be the, a beam hitting it with the same wave front. And the, the difference in path length between where the antenna hits, the, f the beam hits the first antenna and the second antenna, that path length difference is d sine theta, where theta is the angle from the bore side of the antenna to the, to the target, between the line of sight to the target and the bore side of the antenna. Now, the the received target echo varies in phase according to d sine theta divided by 2 pi with a factor of lambda to count the number of wavelengths. So that's the phase difference. So if you measure the phase difference between the signal that arise, arrives from at antenna 1 and antenna 2, that's directly, and you know the distance between the two antennas and the wavelength, you can deduce exactly what the angle that the radiation came in at. And that is how phase comparison monopulse techniques work. Um, unlike amplitude comparison monopulse that receives beams in different directions, this receives the radiation from one direction but at two antennas. Okay. Now, scanning antennas, radars that scan mechanically make fine angle estimation a, a different way. What they do is, uh, is shown in, the, in this next uh, collage of, of uh, graphs. And here we have, first of all, the antenna pattern. And we see we, we've got a main beam. And this red mark is where the fixed target is located. And if we have an antenna that's like this airport surveillance radar, 
it mechanically scans an azimuth going around. This particular one goes around once every 4.7 seconds, about 12 RPM, and the antenna, be antenna beam scans an azimuth by the target and, and as it's emitting pulses. This particular um, radar will uh, transmit about 20 to 25 pulses on the target and the um, the amplitude of both the the signal that hits the target and the echo back are uh, modulated by the antenna beam pattern so that as the, so that uh, this uh, collage of antenna patterns show you the position of the antenna relative to the target for each of the different pulses. Now you can see that when the antenna beam is pointed uh, over in this direction, it'll, it'll, as, as the antenna comes from left to right, there'll be detections here, 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 and here. And in this case, we have the declared target at the center. But what one would do usually is take the antenna pattern and compare that with the pattern of the detections and um, and see how uh, do a fit to the antenna pattern to the set of detections or take a weighted average of the amplitudes um, and to uh, weight the amplitudes for and average together the uh, different returns that are de uh, declared targets and therefore you'll get an accurate estimate of where the target is within the beam. Usually this method can work go about one, one part in eight, one part in ten with reason, quite reasonable signal to noise ratios. Okay, So for tra these radars which measure um, angle a and track while the antenna is mechanically rotating by are called track wall scan radars and it's measured by either taking the highest target return or I said as I said before measuring with interpolation an angle met the angle measurements using the known antenna pattern or some similar technique okay when you have array antennas angle estimation techniques that can be used are both phase and amplitude and phased array antennas are well suited for this monopulse tracking here we have a phased array antenna that's from the BEMUSE radar, ballistic missile early warning radar system, and also a uh, multiple object tracking radar, which is a phased array antenna that uses a lens design. It doesn't have separate TR modules all along the face. It has just the phase shifters, and the phase shifters are set up with the appropriate phase that uh, a horn back here will uh, receive the beam and transmit the beam. Okay, now uh, with the amplitude comparison monopulse techniques the radiative elements can, can be combined three different ways. You can com put all of them together to make the sum pattern. You can combine the right hand side of the beam the right hand side of the face with the left hand side of the face to do azimuth difference monopulse and the top and the bottom half to do elevation difference monopulse patterns. Uh, phase comparison monopulse can use the top and bottom half for elevation and the top right and left half for azimuth. Uh, up here the, co the, uh, the, the different pieces, uh, the different receive elements would send the components into different receivers and that's how the monopulse uh, technique would be implemented. So it would be inside the, the antenna itself that it could be implemented. Now how accurately can you make estimates with monopulse angle techniques? Uh, remember we said that the accuracy was the beam width divided by the square root of the signal to noise ratio and for a typical signal to noise ratio that we've been talking about in the past for good detection of 13 dB, uh, that'll allow us to um, get 10 to 1 beam splitting. So with 13 dB beam width, a 13 dB of signal to noise ratio, uh, 
if the detection threshold is 13 dB, uh, beam width can be split by 10 to 1. Okay. Now I'd just like to go over a couple of um, definitions that you may hear and I'd like you to understand them exactly. Sort of what's the difference between accuracy, precision, and resolution. Um, now accuracy is the degree of conformity of measurements to their true value. Okay. Now here we have a bullseye and the black marks mark where either an arrow or a bullet has hit. Obviously the degree of conformity to the measurement to the true place you want to hit would be if you got uh, you'd be very highly accurate if you hit the center. Okay? Precision refers to the repeatability of the measurements. In other words, um, it, it's a, it says we have a small uh, bias error. Uh, excuse me. The bias error, I'd like to define first. The bias error is the true value minus the average of the measured value. If the average of the measured values are all clustered together, then we have high precision. It's only when they are both clustered. To, this would be an example over here on the right of some bullets that had very high precision but low accuracy. There's a significant bias error. And here in the center, we have both high accuracy. We're hitting very close to where we want to and high precision. And here in the left, we have low accuracy, we're far away from the bullseye, and low precision, they're not, repeat, not very repeatable. Okay? Now, resolution is our ability to separate two targets. When we see the amplitudes, say if our ability to resolve two targets in angle, we would look at the return that we get as a function of angle. And if we had, uh, here we have two targets at 0 and 6 degrees, and if we have about a 2.5, a 3 degree beam, we'll be able to see that indeed we have two targets. This would say we're able to resolve two targets at uh, targets at 0 and 6 degrees. We see two specific bumps. Now here we have a target at, at 0 degrees and 3 degrees, and we can't resolve them. They're, they're the, uh, they're too far apart. They, we see them as just one bump, so they're unresolved. Here's a, a, a case of an unresolved target and a resolved, where we've resolved two targets. Okay? In each case, there are multiple targets, but with the better resolution, or rather than better resolution, with the targets being further apart, we're able to resolve them. Now on to Doppler velocity estimation. The Doppler frequency is given by twice the vol radial velocity over the wavelength. And what we do is we use two closely spaced Doppler filters uh, that are offset from the center frequency of the Doppler filter containing the detection. So here's the target velocity. And we have two Doppler filters that overlap so they both detect the target. Uh, knowing the shape of the uh, Doppler frequency response and knowing the amplitude of the detection in each of the two filters, we can estimate the, um, the exact Doppler frequency. And the Doppler frequency measurement accuracy is proportional, as we said earlier, to the wavelength divided by the coherent integration time, and it's proportional to the inverse of the square root of the signal-to-noise ratio. Now, what are the real-world limitations to accuracy? Well, receiver noise can be a big factor. It's going to add uh, a width of variance to the estimates we make. If a radar isn't calibrated well, it'll lead to poor estimations. And the calibration uh, quite often will lead to a bias where we, we will very precisely say the target is located at this range, this range, this range, but it's really a separate range because we're not calibrated uh, quite exactly. We could be calibrated either on the scale, the magnification, or we could be offset. The offset would be a bias. Amplitude fluctuations in the target can affect both monopulse and array accuracy solutions. And then also, uh, angle glint and, scintill and scintillations of the target 
and angle scintillations from complex targets. Uh, that is to say, if we had an, a complex target and we got returns from multiple scatterers on the object, that can cause the angle measurement, which depends on phase, to uh, oscillate wildly. Uh, in, in, mon in the monopulse equation, you notice it depended on the cosine of the phase of the difference between the sum and difference signal. If you have multiple scatterers within the cell that you're measuring, uh, that angle noise can be very great and can actually cause the uh, target to appear outside the cell of interest. And a monopulse can break down uh, when you have multiple targets within the range azimuth cell of interest. And also multipath, which we talked about in the propagation uh, lecture, uh, can give angle problems when we're doing low angle tracking. Uh, this next diagram shows you a little better, brings you back to a cartoon we showed you earlier, where we have reflections off the Earth's surface combined with the direct path, and this um, interference can cause biases in the angle estimates for all the different techniques. Now, on our outline, we're moving on to tracking. Okay, this, uh, this, these two, the first photograph on the left shows you a whole bunch of detections that come over many, many scans of the radar. And this would be a track well scan radar, most probably, I'm guessing. And these would be the observations you get. And just from your human eye, looking on the, the left, your eye can correlate and say, well, these are probably all correlated with the same physical object. These probably are, these are, these here are, those are, and those are. Now, our eye can't tell just from what you see whether this detection came, and then that one came, and then that one, and that one. A very improbable event, obviously. We can't tell right now the time correlation, but inside a computer you can, and with taking it into account that probably the track started at one end or the other here, You've got a detection here, then another one a little more up and more up, and gee, we know the direction the target's heading. We'll know where to look and find new detections to add to that track file. You'd form a track. And over here, this is a typical tracker output. And what you'll have are tracks from actual targets that are existing tracks, and then you'll have a lot of little new tracks. And these new tracks, some of them may be caused by noise, and some of them may be ca caused by targets which have just moved into the volume scan of the, ant of the antenna and they're just starting off. So uh, the tracker receives new observations every scan. Uh, some of them are observations from the target and some of them are false alarms. And as you can probably guess, these little dots in and around here are false alarms. And then new tracks are initiated. That'll be the sequence. We always try to find the new tracks. Existing tracks will be updated, and tracks which we don't get any more detections from, after a while, they'll be deleted from the track file. Now we're going to go over in just a little bit the exact logical process that a tracker follows. Okay? And this, and, when, and this is all done by a computer in the um, data processing computer section of the block diagram. It's an, uh, we're going to go over what the algorithms are for automatic detection and tracking. Now, after we've used our clutter rejection techniques, um, uh, now we're able to automate detection and tracking. Uh, years ago, before good clutter rejection techniques uh, happened, automatic tracking techniques really weren't used at all. And, and then when they were tried, they didn't work well. But now that we're able to have you, you to use and implement first-rate uh, clutter rejection uh, signal processing techniques, pretty much what we see in the residue are the targets we want to see and noise, which is pretty much random. That's what we see most of the time. And the detection and tracking functions are target detection and target association. We're going to take at them just one at a time. Target detection, of course, we uh, perform that function by having an adaptive threshold. We went over that earlier in the detection lecture, and we'll apply that to each range azimuth Doppler cell. Then after that, we want to associate uh, in, uh, threshold crossings from adjacent range azimuth do Doppler cells, or nearly adjacent ones, 
we want to associate them and say, hey, they probably come one from another, and use that to calculate the uh, range and azimuth and Doppler of the target. So first we'll look and say, hey, are there any neighbors nearby, neighbors that would be caused by detections in the main lobe, in azimuth, elevation, and Doppler, and cluster them all together and say, yeah, these guys are all part of one target. And after we say they're yeah, all part of one target, we want to make the best estimate possible of that range, azimuth, and Doppler of the target on a single scan basis. Okay, now what do we do with that detection afterwards? We send it through this logic right here. Okay, the first thing we do is because we've got a lot of investment in them, is if we have tracks that we ought, we we really we know from real targets, we know that it's most probable that uh, new data should, is, could be associated with a real track that's continuing, then if it just pops up and it's just a, you know, a detection, do we want to start a new track? So the first thing you try to do is correlate any new detections with existing tracks. See if they correlate and add to a new track. We don't want to set up a new track every scan. We first want to do the correlation. And then we want to, so this association is added by seeing if the detections fall within a search window. We'll look at that in a minute. Then with the detections that didn't associate, what we'll do is we'll initiate new tracks for a little bit and, see, and, and set a window out and see if other detections in the next scan are nearby to see if we can start up tracks. And target initiation in dense clutter environments can stress a clutter a computer resources we have available. And so what we do is we measure, develop the uh, detection reports uh, with new observations and then try to associate them with um, existing targets first and the ones that don't associate we go into the initiation. But then also after we update targets we go into the prediction and say, hey, where should the target be next so we can do association at a later time. Okay, now we're, we're in the track association and update. We have uh, the present location of the target and at that point we know its range, azimuth, elevation, and its velocity vector. And from that we're able to predict where the target should be. And if it's not maneuvering, if, it's, if, it's, if there aren't any accelerations on the object between where we see it, or any differences in acceleration, we're, we're pretty well able to say that the target, where it should be, and what the errors are based on our ability to measure range angle and Doppler. And so we can put um, a boundary in range azimuth uh, space and Doppler space as to where in that volume we should expect it the, in the next scan, the target to appear, if it's and it have one volume if it's non-maneuvering, but if it maneuvered, it could go off and take a, a jog. If an airplane, say, was uh, going in a straight line and then it took a maneuver and took a right-hand turn, so to speak, but it might be in five seconds, it's going at right angles and would be outside this non-maneuvering so-called range gate. So we set up a couple of range gates. And as I said, the size of that gate is determined by the estimation errors of the predicted position and the speed, errors in the speed and direction of the target. And we want that gate small enough that we'll hopefully have not more than one detection falling within the gate. We would just, we'd like to have just one fall within the gate. We don't want it so big, a lot of noise false alarms would fall in there too. But we want it large enough to uh, detect turns and targets. And sometimes, as I said, that's handled by having two gates, a non-maneuvering gate and a maneuvering gate. And if association is successful, we update the track files, say where the target is moved to, and if not, we um, do a new, have a new target and initiate a new target, this box over here. Okay, now after we've associated the target, then we want to use a tracker a filtering technique which would do the prediction of where it would go. And there are different methods of developing this prediction technique. One's an alpha beta tracker, another one's called the Kalman filter. And these estimate, take the present estimates of where we have measured the target to be and its velocity, predict where it will be in the future, and so that process continues. 
Now, if we didn't find data for a couple of scans of the radar, uh, in the meantime, when we don't find it for a scan or two, we might coast the target and say, well, there might have been a dropout, because there's a just a finite probability that we'll see a target there. And there's a finite probability that we won't. In the meantime, what we do is we we'll coast the target, the track, if we don't see it. And if after a number of scans that we uh, fail to see it, the target may have landed if it's an aircraft, um, it may, if it's a missile, it might have been shot down or whatever, and a, a note would go to the display operator that the target was then terminated. Okay? Now, the, the techniques that I just described are those typically used with a, an airport surveillance radar or a scanning radar. When you're tracking with a phased array radar, you use very similar techniques, but there's some advantages you have with a phased array radar. When we talked about uh, phased array antennas, you noted that we have beam agility. We can electronically move the beams anywhere we want and move them very fast. So we can have a very high update rate, uh, much higher than with a mechanical scanning antenna, where it might take you, oh, five or six seconds to move a heavy antenna over 20 or 30 degrees. With an, uh, an electronically scanned array, you can move in microseconds, in tens of microseconds, you can move the beam over and collect data. So uh, we can collect uh, data uh, and track data on targets at multiple places in wide solid angle with phased array radars, and that's an advantage that they have. And uh, there's no closed loop uh, feedback controlling the radar beam. With phased arrays, the computer controls the radar beam and the track update rate, and that is done with algorithms within the control computer, which says how often we go back. Uh, they're not the feedback loops and tracking that we would use with uh, those dish radars when we talked about monopulse and, and conical scanning. So there aren't those control control loops, uh, so to speak. Okay. Now there's one other tr uh, detector detection method I want to um, mention, and it's called a lot of different things. It's called track before detect, um, long-term coherent integration, um, and what it basically is doing, it's gobbling into the computer. Not, you're not looking at the data one scan at a time and then saying, okay, some, some targets I'll initiate a track on, some I'll add to tracks they already have. What you do is you put a lot of data in the computer all together, say from 10 or 15, 20 scans of the radar, and then you, you try a whole bunch of hypotheses uh, for all of the detections fitting together such that they make sense from a kinematic point of view and from a time causality point of view. That is, that they lie along a relatively smooth line in space and time at a reasonable velocity. There are, we don't, you don't allow uh, incredible non-physical changes in acceleration of velocity. And th these uh, long integration times imply the target may transverse, traverse many resolution selves during this integration time. And since the target trajectory is not known ahead of time, you assume all possible trajectories. When you think about that, you say, gee, that computer is really going to be crunching. And it is true. This technique is very intensive computationally, but computers have grown incredibly powerful in the past years. And a correct trajectory is one that gives us, as I said, a realistic speed and, and direction for the type of target being observed. And in a sense, what you're doing is you're tracking the target before it is declared a detection. Sometimes this is called retrospective detection, a long-term integration, but this same process which I've just described is what's happening. And this allows you, when you do that, it allows you to raise the probability of false alarm per scan that you can tolerate, maybe 10 to the minus 3 probability of false alarm per cell, rather than 10 to the minus 5 or 6, and you let the computer do the chugging before you declare a target. Okay. And that you see, so you've got a lot of constraints, maybe 20 scans in a row, it's got to make good sense that you've got a target that's kinematically reasonable with realistic speeds and directions before you display it to an operator. 
okay? And that also has the, that, that extra demanding that it makes sense for a large number of scans from a physical point of view um, allows you to, to, to process all those extra false alarms without displaying them, because you're not going to display anything until you've seen it for a long time. Now what that does is that there's a significant delay between where you first might see the target and you declare it. That's a downside of this, but it allows you to then see lower signal-to-noise ratio targets with reasonable probabilities of detecting the track. And as I said, this requires very strong data processing capability and long observation times. So now in summary, summarizing what we've learned about parameter estimation and tracking, Parameter estimation techniques enable the radar to get very good, accurate radar measurements in range, angle, and Doppler. And monopulse angle estimation allows sub-beam width accuracy to see within a beam width when we're talking for single pulse radars just where the target is. And we went over techniques also for measuring a, a range accurately and Doppler accurately. And there are limitations to these monopulse techniques due to multiple targets or interference. And we went over tracking algorithms and how they work and how they help us to uh, find and predict the target track and get the best fit between our measured data and the actual location of the target's trajectory.